This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision making from two Canadians. We're hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital. Welcome to episode 231. You know, Ben, as you know, I finished off the backdrop in my office here last night, put a picture on Twitter about it. I think I'm up to almost 100 likes, which for me is a lot. So you never know what really strikes a chord. But I want to give a shout out to a company called thequietroom.ca, which I guess you told me about. But that's where I got these these panels from. Small, well, I'm not sure how, how large they are, but it's a company based in Toronto. Great service, great product. They don't even know I'm talking about this. They did not pay us for this. But if people, because a bunch of people asked online last night where I got them. And so just I let people know if they're looking for panels, quietroom.ca. You notice I got a teddy bear on my wall there too. I had it. I've been given a teddy bear in like whatever, 45 years, but I had minor surgery last week and I came home and the kids gave me a teddy bear from Oscar. So I thought oh, that's kind okay. of appropriate to put up on the wall, a teddy bear. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Uh, <laughs> well, in case people are wondering, why do why I have a teddy bear there? Um, squirrels are in your life. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we bought a house that wasn't quite quite finished, even though it was 20 years old. Um, so the... The soffits are an ongoing project, and yeah, some squirrels are. They they were in there. I, I think they, they I think they're gone right now. The joys of homeownership. I was going to say it's an expression of your pleasure of being a homeowner. Uh, this is our last us episode for 2022. Since in two weeks, it's our fourth, if you can believe it, year in review episode coming up. So crazy. Yeah, we get the and. Uh, work on that on Monday we're going to be recording that episode all the intros and setups of all the highlights of the year what a year it's been and I tell you when you look at the list uh, as we head into 2023 the the guests we have coming up are unbelievable they include Nobel laureate Robert Merton lawyer Harold Geller professor Ralph Keeney who is the author of give yourself a nudge Eric Johnson author of the elements of choice Daniel Pink author of regret and other books and Charlie Ellis, who in our space is probably best known for the book Winning the Losers Game, but also author of the recently released Inside Vanguard, which I finished on the weekend. Fantastic book. Really gets into the history of Vanguard more detail than like Robin Wigglesworth book. Trillions did. Love the book. So that's going to be a great episode. I've been emailing back and forth with, with uh Mr. Ellis, Charlie, and it, boy, he seems like a, just a great guy. We're going to have a great time with that interview. So it's just a going to be a great lineup. So lots of books there if anyone's looking for something to read over the holidays. To get I, I love up. how the, the, a lot of those guests, they, they kind of close the loop on a lot of stuff that we talked about in 2022. Like with we talked about the ICAPMs a ton throughout 2022. And Merton, of course, is the creator of that model. So we kind of closed the loop on that. Uh, Ralph Keeney, that's the... The uh, goal generation papers. That's what that's. Uh, he wrote those papers. So that I think the whole genesis of our goal survey project that was right. pretty interesting. That came from from Ralph uh, Daniel Pink. Uh, the, the the big section of our paper on regret of, of the finding and funding a good life paper. A lot of that came from Daniel Pink's book and and research. So it's kind of it's kind of neat to see uh, neat to see the progression of stuff that happened last year and and how it's translating to the guests that we're going to be talking to next year. So one thing we learned from the uh, Chris Hadfield episode is that we we'll have to make sure people know what's coming up. So you have to give a plug for next week episode with uh, Professor Anna Maria Lusardi. Yeah, I don't know what we learned. I don't know what the lesson was from the Chris Hadfield episode. I don't know if it's that we need to be better at episode titles or I, I don't know what the lesson was. But there, so uh, we, we weren't planning on talking about this much, but the, the comments that have been coming in since we said that in, in, uh, in our last Us episode, since we told people, hey, go listen to the Chris Hadfield episode because it was good, a ton of people have come back and said, wow, like this is the best episode right. you guys have ever done, ever, period. And like, thank you for telling me to go listen to it. Anyway, so I don't know what the lesson is there. But uh, on that note, Anna, Anna Maria Lusardi, um, who is... I would be comfortable arguing that the, the world leading expert on financial literacy, uh, on the, the empirical side of how financially literate is the world and, and how does that vary across segments of the population and, and across countries and stuff like that. 
uh, but also what can we be doing to improve it and what does the evidence suggest about what is effective and what what isn't. So her, her research informed a lot of the stuff that I've talked about in the last uh, few months about financial literacy and we finally got to talk to her. I, I, I told her, and I say this in the introduction to the episode, <laughs> and she... And I say this too in the episode with her. She she didn't like. I don't know if she didn't like it, but she said like, "Don't don't exaggerate." What I said to her is that I I I can't get out of my head that she is to financial literacy what Gene Fama is to efficient markets, and I don't think that is an exaggeration because the quality and quantity of her research and her passion for the topic is just absolutely uh, incredible. And she she has got to be the most cited uh, the most cited author on the on the topic. Anyway. So that, that was a great conversation. And Cameron, I think you would agree. She brought a great uh, energy and, and, and clear passion. Um, but she also has this, like, she comes with, with the theoretical and empirical rigor that you would, like like the Fama example. It's just incredible yep. on that topic. Yeah. So that's next week. I want to give a quick shout out. Speaking of listeners, I was in Charlotte, as you know, in October at a conference. And uh, one of the uh, advisors I met there, Patty from Dublin, Ended up sending me a little, little gift box from from Guinness, as well as this picture for those on YouTube, of a bunch of us that were at, at this conference. Who invited us to go out to a local Irish pub in Charlotte? Who sent sent me this picture of all of us there? So, shout out to all the great people I met in Charlotte. Incredible picture, incredible people. Many are very avid listeners of the podcast. So, thanks to Patty for doing such a kind uh, thing and sending this card out to all of us. Really appreciate it. You want to dive back into the two point something percent rule. I don't know if this belongs in the introduction of an episode or in the after show, but it's it's in the introduction. Uh, I, I I figured people would be eager to hear about it after they listen to to the episode about the two percent rule. Uh, so I, as I expected, and as I said at the beginning of of that episode, uh, lots of feathers were were ruffled when when we said that the safe withdrawal rate is is two percent, uh, which is obviously very low. Now one of the one of the threads that we had left hanging uh, at, at the end of that episode was that adding international stocks, because that that research was based on, that, that we talked about in the 2% withdrawal rate episode, was based on domestic stocks. So Scott Cedarberg had done this, this very interesting research on safe withdrawal rates, but he had taken the perspective of a domestic stock and bond investor. Right. So one of the things that we left hanging at the end of the episode was, hey, one of the things that might help this is international diversification, but we don't we don't know by how much. We we can't quantify how much better that would make things. I emailed Scott after we did the episode to just say like because I, I actually I wanted to do a, a common sense investing uh, video on this topic, but I, I I thought you know what before I do that before I go and tell everybody that two percent is a safe withdrawal rate, but maybe international stocks help a little bit, but I don't know by how much. I emailed Scott just to say, do you, do you think you might at some point add international stocks to your paper? Because then I would wait. And he replied and said he had listened to the episode and done the analysis. He'd run the numbers <laughs> for international stocks based on what we had, we had said in, uh, in, in the episode, cool. I, I, I guess. Uh, so then, and then he gave me the data. And I said, can I, like, I, can, I can reference this? Like I can use it? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Uh, so now we have the data for international stocks, which is, in my opinion, very exciting. Uh, he gave us 60-40 portfolios with uh, 36% domestic stocks, 24% international stocks, and 40% bonds. And he also gave us 6% domestic, 54% international, and 40% bonds. So we got like a kind of like a home-biased but diversified investor and a less home-biased um, and more internationally diversified investor. And as we had talked about in the podcast episode, he also added additional costs to the ownership of international stocks. Mm -hmm. Because for, for a domestic investor, typically between fees, taxes, withholding taxes, you're going you're gonna to have higher costs to own international stocks. So he added 50 basis points. And so the punchline is that he found for, uh, for the 2085 retirement date, so that's for like newborns today, which I found... Uh, just looking at the numbers is, is similar to a Canadian retiree couple today. So just Canadians have slightly longer life expectancies than Americans. So we use the 2085 retirement date. The 
uh, home biased, internationally diversified investor has a safe withdrawal rate of 2.57%. And the more inter- internationally diversified investor with, with 6% in their home country has a safe withdrawal rate of 2.76%. So between those two numbers, uh, I, I like in the common sense investing video that I'll do on this topic, I just called it the 2.7% <laughs> safe withdrawal rate. Uh, anyway, that, awesome to have those numbers, but it was also very cool to have uh, someone like Scott, who's obviously a past guest and he's been active in the Rational Minder community to have him uh, run run these numbers and give them to us. Was, I mean, it's that's that's incredible. Like that's mind blowing to me. There's a paper that did that's out there that anybody can read. But then we we got we got additional data. Uh, we got to turn over some rocks that that nobody else had turned over. I thought that was very love it exciting. Love it. All right, coming up in today's episode, your main topic is investing basics and common questions. You want to add anything, add anything to that? No, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it when I introduce okay. the topic. Uh, I'll do a 60 second recap of our interview with Cliff Asnes, which was back in episode 93. Uh, this week, I also will do a quick review of the Culture Playbook, which is a follow up book from uh, Daniel Coyle, who is the author of The Culture Code, which we reviewed back in episode 187. This is a great book, so I thought I'd do a quick review of that. For inspiration as part of the 22 and 22 Reading Challenge, we welcome a very special guest, Professor Amr Kaisi. Amr is the, book, is the author of the book, Humbitious, The Power of Low Ego, High Drive Leadership, which I think, as listeners know, is one of my favorite books on leadership and one that I've recommended often. Um, we reviewed this book back in episode 189. Professor Kaisi is a uh, executive coach as well as a professor of health care administration at Trinity University. Ben, anything else or should we go to the episode? No, yeah, it was, this is like our longest intro in a while because we had the save withdrawal rate stuff in there. So let, let's go ahead. Welcome to episode 231 of the Rational Minder podcast. All right, let's kick it off with your main topic. Investing basics. Yeah, so I had investing basics and, and then and then common questions afterwards. I, you know, we, we probably don't talk about topics like this often enough. Um, I, when I'm thinking about what to talk about in the podcast and what what research avenues are going to be interesting, like of course, so a lot of it is informed by the work that I'm doing for our our clients, and that ends up forming a lot of the topics that we talk about. Uh, but it, but in addition to that, I'm often imagining the the representative podcast listener uh, as you know somebody who's in the rational minder community that I'm interacting with uh, over the internet. But I, I you know th- th- there's a ton of listeners who are not in the rational minder community. And the other thing that we learned that we'll we'll talk about some data later uh, is that a lot of our listeners, like the majority of them, discovered the podcast in 2022. So this this idea that I get stuck in this idea that, that, that we always have to be doing new new research and and, and building on past uh, research that, that we've done to keep kind of uh, to, to keep things interesting uh, for this representative listener that I have in my mind, but <laughs> I have to remind myself sometimes that that's not that's not necessarily the representative. Yeah, and if you're listener. a new listener, it's not safe for us to assume that you're going to go back and listen to 185 previous episodes. And even then, like how many episodes have we done on basic topics? That's what I'm saying, <laughs> right? Uh, we could probably count them on one hand. Uh, so a- anyway, the, 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 that was part of the inspiration for this is that I want, I want to bring it back to basics. Um, and if, if you know, the, the three uh, nerdiest Rational Reminder community members find this episode boring, I, I apologize, but <laughs> hopefully everybody else finds it interesting. Um, this is based on on a talk that I I gave to the the, the personal finance club uh, at a large uh, global tech company last week. I was I was invited by them to come and to come and speak, which is kind of fun. I hadn't done a talk like that in in years. Uh, I, I used to do them every month, but I I just we've got other people on our team that are typically doing that now. Uh, so I, I prepared this talk and I, I figured it was it was interesting to go through and then also the the common questions are from that somewhat 
and then also we, we have a bank of, of common questions uh, that in, in the, the talks that other people on the team usually do uh, that we try and cover. So that is the setup for the topic. Ready? I'm ready. Okay. So investing is a huge topic. Obviously, as we were just joking about, there's, there's so many things that you can cover without even talking about the basics. Uh, there are thousands of books written on it. Personal finance has its own celebrities, which is kind of funny to think about. Uh, and, and, and then, of course, there are all of the academics who have made impressive careers researching how markets work, how people make decisions, uh, how financial literacy impacts, like we were talking about Anna Maria Lusardi, uh, and, and what all that means for investors. There's all these, all these sources of information. Uh, one of the problems, I think, is that the popular investing books and the personal finance celebrities are often at odds with the academic literature, which of course makes it challenging to know what actually makes makes sense. Uh, so I wanna provide a basic overview of investing that will hopefully help people cut through the noise. I guess one of the other useful things about an episode like this is that maybe it's more shareable, because I know that's feedback we've gotten before that someone who listens to the podcast that wants to send something to their, you know, their mom or whatever, it's not always easy to know what to send. Uh, okay. So from the ground up, the basics, when a company needs to raise capital to finance its business, it can, broadly speaking, there are lots of, uh, hybrids, I guess, but broadly speaking, it can issue debt where it's borrowing money from investors or it can issue equity where it's selling off some ownership, uh, in, in the company's future cash flows to investors. Now, why would investors invest? Investors want to invest their financial capital to earn a positive real return. Um, people typically have labor income for only a portion of their lives. So they, they save some of that labor income to fund their expenses in, in the future. Now, if people just stuck those savings under their mattress, they would lose money over time due to inflation. Uh, even in economically stable countries, like I would consider Canada to be generally, uh, even in Canada, we target low but stable inflation. But that low but stable inflation adds up over time. And then, of course, there are also periods like now that we're living through where inflation can be higher than normal. Um, and in both cases, whether it's low and stable or whether it's uh, whatever it is now, that erodes the purchasing power of cash. Uh, so rather than sticking their savings under a mattress, investors may choose to take a little bit of risk by providing the capital to the companies that, that need it. Uh, from the investor's perspective, uh, investing in debt, so in, in investing in bonds, is relatively safe because the company is obligated to make its interest payments. And if it's unable to do so, bond investors typically have a claim on the company's assets. Okay. On the other hand, if a company does very well, bondholders aren't, aren't going to financially benefit from the success of the company in the same way that equ equity holders do. If you're a bond investor and a, a, a company that, that you've purchased a bond of does extremely well, you, you just get your coupon payments and you get your principal back at, uh, at maturity. Uh, in, investing in equities, in, in stocks, in, in pieces of ownership of the company is riskier than investing in bonds because the value of a company's stock will fluctuate from day to day as the market's assessment of its expected cash flows and the riskiness of those cash flows changes. Bond prices, I mean, this is a little more nuanced, I guess. Bond prices can fluctuate pretty significantly too with market discount rates, whether that's because the riskiness of the country or the company that has issued the bond changes or because market uh, rates have changed, market discount rates have changed, which has been a big part of the story this year. And bond prices have actually changed a lot, a lot more than they typically do in a given year. Unlike bond investors, equity investors are unlikely to be compensated in the event of a corporate failure. So that's another big difference. Equity investors can and typically would lose all of their investment if a, if a company is unsuccessful. Um, but, but the other side of that trade-off is that if the company exceeds the market's expectations, stockholders can benefit from high returns. So that's the kind of the opposite of the bondholders who have a fixed return. Equity investors have an uh, un uncertain return, but they have the potential to earn higher returns or, or to lose everything. So a much, much wider range of possible outcomes for stockholders. In the long run, 
stock investors expect to earn higher returns than bond investors. That, that has to be true, at least on expectations, because stock investors need an incentive to invest in the riskier asset. Uh, now, that, that, the, the way that differences in risk are expressed in, in asset pricing is through the discount rate that, that investors apply to the expected cash flows of a financial asset. So a higher discount rate implies a riskier asset. It costs less. A higher, a higher discount rate means it costs less to buy the future cash flows of riskier financial assets. So if you yeah. actually receive those cash flows, you earn a higher return because you paid less for them. You, you had a, a higher discount rate. Very important concept. Oh yeah, discount rates are big. Discount rates are huge. Just, just that in general, asset pricing, the concept of discounted future cash flows, that, that's what a financial asset is and expected returns are the discount rate. Very important, I agree. Uh, so investors expect, expect to earn a return that is equal, this is what I was just saying, equal to the rate at which they're discounting future cash flows. So to, to, to summarize on this quickly, when companies need to raise capital, they can issue debt or equity to investors. Uh, investors in bonds, that's in, in, in debt, get a relatively safe investment return consisting of coupon payments and principal repayment when the bond matures, but they also get limited upside. Investors in equities have less certainty about the future of their investment. They don't have fixed cash flows. Uh, and that comes with a much wider range of outcomes from total loss, which actually happens fairly frequently, or at least significant losses do. We'll talk about some of that data later. Uh, all the way up to market beating uh, returns. So a much wider range of outcomes. Now, a really important point here is that no investor, so we've got these financial assets out there, we've got investors out here that they want to earn a return, but no investor, at least in public markets, interacts with companies in a vacuum. There, there's a highly competitive market for financial assets where investors are competing with each other to earn the best possible return relative to the risk that they're taking. No single investor, we talked to Robert Merton about this, I love the way he described market efficiency, and this was part of it. Uh, no, no single investor can possibly have access to all of the information that will affect the price of a stock or bond. But the aggregate of all investors, the market price, is a pretty good representation of all information. You can have the smartest investor in the world, but to assume that they have all available information is unrealistic under any circumstances. Mm -hmm. But the aggregate of all investors is all information. And that's, what, that's the price, that we, we get that information in the price. Now, how, how does that work? What's the mechanism? If you, Cameron, own a stock, but I think I have some information about the stock that you don't have, I will offer to buy it from you for a price above what you think it's worth. And you may choose to sell it to me. By agreeing on a price for, for a transaction, we are inputting the information that we have into the price. And financial markets serve this function of bringing together thousands or, or, or more of, of traders who are competing to bring unique information to the market yep. in an effort to earn a profit. But again, no single trader can possibly have all available information. The product that we get from that process is prices, market prices. And because prices contain all that information from all of the competitive trading, we can infer what discount rate the market, the aggregation of all of these competitive traders, is applying to the cash flows of financial assets. So I talked earlier about how discount, we, we both talked about how discount rates are important. Um, but what is the discount rate? Well, computing it is kind of hard to go and estimate what I think the discount rate for a financial asset is. But the market in aggregate tells us approximately, or at least it tells us about differences in discount rates between, between companies. Uh, if, if you take more risk by investing in assets with higher discount rates, you expect to earn a higher return. But, I, but it's not a free lunch. You expect to earn a higher return because you're taking more risk. That's right. Um, now, so we talked about risk. We talked about discount rates. Discount rates reflect risk, but it's important to draw a distinction between two types of risk that, that are important in, in investing. One is systematic risk. That is the type of risk where you earn a positive expected return uh, for purchasing discounted risky future cash flows. Systematic risk is also known as priced risk, and it's also known as non-diversifiable risk. 
It's called priced because it's reflected in the discount rate, which is reflected in the price of the asset. And it's called non-diversifiable because you can't make this type of risk go away. It's systematic. It's everywhere. It's in, it's in all assets. So you can't diversify away systematic risk. The other type of risk is, is idiosyncratic or, or diversifiable or unpriced risk. Uh, that, that's the type of risk that's associated with the specific circumstances of an individual company. So an example might be a company executive tweeting something inappropriate, causing the company to, to decline in, in value. That type of risk is not priced. It's not associated with differences in expected returns. So typically, investors want to diversify away idiosyncratic risk by owning multiple companies in their portfolio. The number of companies that you need to diversify idiosyncratic risk away kind of depends on how you measure risk. There's been different different ways to approach this. But as a generalization, I would just say that more diversification is better than less. Um, the, 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 the distribution of individual stock returns tends to exhibit extreme skewness, which means that most stocks don't do very well. A relatively small number do extremely well. Uh, the, the, the result is that you're, as an investor, much more likely to miss out on winners than losers by trying to pick and choose which individual individual stocks you think are going to do well. Um, okay. And any questions so far? No, keep going. I'm not breaking this. <laughs> You're on a roll. Okay. Uh, so the, 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 the other thing that we have to understand is what affects the actual returns of the stock. So we talk about expected returns. It's kind of this theoretical concept. It's the discount rate. Uh, it's the return you expect to earn. But what does that actually mean about the return that you're going to earn? Those are two distinct concepts, expected returns and realized returns. So expected returns, are this, I'm repeating this, but they're the discount rate applied to expected cash flows. A great company, a great company, whatever, I don't know, Apple. Uh, that's a good company, right? People would agree on that? Mm-hmm. I think so. I, 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 and I don't know how... Uh, low Apple's discount rate actually is at the moment. But anyway, a a great company with a low discount rate. Now, how do we know it has a low discount rate? When you look at the price of a company that has a high price relative to some fundamental measure, like its book value or its earnings or something like that, a high price typically indicates a low expected return, typically indicates a low discount rate. Now, your actual return, and we saw this a lot. Remember, we were talking about all of the FANG stock, whatever that acronym ended up being. Uh, as their returns kept going up, and we kept saying, well, no, they've got, they've got really low discount rates. They've got high prices. Their expected returns are low, but their prices kept going up higher and higher and higher. Yep. That's the unexpected return. Your actual return that you get is your, ex- your expected return plus your unexpected return. The, expected re- the, the unexpected return is going to be related to new information that was not previously in the price. So as an investor, I think it's really challenging to bet on the unexpected return because like new information cannot be reliably, reliably predicted. At least I don't know how to do that. So I think it's worth focusing on the expected return, but you've got to understand that the unexpected return is going to have a lot of influence on the outcome, especially over shorter periods of time. Ken French, episode 100. That's blazed on my brain. That's exactly what he said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that was, a, that was a, great, a great episode with Ken. Um, so yes, the unexpected return will dominate the outcome. And now that can go both ways, right? Like we've seen those same FANG stocks, they've come down in price. The, the unexpected return was a little bit, uh, what went in the other direction in, in, in more recent history. And I, I also think on the unexpected return, betting on the unexpected return starts to look a lot more like gambling than like investing. Uh, so what it, t- taking what I've said so far and applying it to building a portfolio to like, what should you invest in? I think a good starting point for any investor is the market portfolio, which can be approximated by public stock and bond markets, which you can proxy using stock and bond index funds. Now, theoretically, If you believe that market prices reflect all available information, the optimal portfolio for the average investor is well represented by the market portfolio of stocks and bonds. That's that's why I said that. 
which can again be approximated using low cost index funds designed to track those markets. Now, while it is theoretically optimal for the average investor, there are a couple, two main ones that I can think of, reasons that you would want to be different from the market portfolio. So the market portfolio, great for the average investor, um, nice and easy, theoretically sound, so on and so forth. Um, but why would you want to do something different? One reason, and probably the most common reason, at least if you look at the data on how people invest their money, is that you do not believe that market prices reflect all available information. If you think you have an edge as one of the traders competing to bring new information into prices, you wouldn't want to own the market portfolio because you think you have an edge. You think you can earn more returns in the market without taking additional risk by bringing your information to the market. Now, I think, I think the challenge here can be illustrated with a basketball analogy. I got this from Jordan on our, on our team who's been on the podcast before. He, he told me this analogy. And it's sim- I mean, it's simple, um, but I thought, it was really, I thought it was really good. Maybe because I like basketball, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll say the analogy. So I, I have played a lot of basketball in my life. I am comfortable saying, even though I'm not very good at basketball, I'm comfortable saying that I am an above average basketball player. But if I played one-on-one against LeBron James, he would win every possession. I've got a pretty good jump shot, so I don't know, but he'd probably, he'd probably be able to block it and stop me from going to the basket at the same time. <laughs> um, and so, so if I, 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 I could probably beat, you know, I don't know what the number is, 95% of the population one-on-one in basketball, but LeBron would, would beat me. In the financial markets, even if you are the LeBron James equivalent of trading, most other large traders are going to be at your level. So it's not like you can be LeBron and dominate. You're going to be LeBron competing against LeBron, and the outcome of every possession is going to be determined by luck, by which way the wind was blowing or, or whose shoe slipped or whatever. Now, this, of course, shows up in lots of academic studies and industry reports on the performance of funds that try to earn higher returns without taking more risk. That's the, uh, the holy grail of investing known as alpha, excess risk-adjusted returns. Uh, funds try to do this by selecting securities and timing the market. The vast majority of these funds, which as many listeners will know, are called actively managed funds, are unable to deliver alpha. And the ones that have been successful delivering alpha in the past, beating the market in the past, uh, are no more likely to be successful in the future. There's not persistence in performance. Most actively managed funds charge high fees. They're typically tax inefficient, and many of them also lack diversification. If all they're delivering is tax inefficient exposure to systematic risk with added noise due to a lack of diversification, investors can instead, and probably should instead, get their systematic risk exposure using low cost, tax efficient, and well diversified index funds. You sound like that, your CSI video just there. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the that's one reason that you would maybe want to be different because you think you're smarter than the market. The evidence suggests you're probably not. Uh, I think John Cochran jokes about this in his paper on portfolios for long-term investors too. But that brings me to the other reason, speaking of John Cochran's paper, the other reason that you might want your portfolio to look different from the market portfolio is if you're different from the average investor. We've talked about this a ton this year. Uh, it's, it's worth touching on just very brief, briefly though. Um, be, being different from average based on your individual characteristics uh, is, is a choice about which risks you want to take. In that case, you're not, you're not trying to outsmart the market. You're not trying to earn alpha. You're just looking at the risks that are available in financial markets and deciding, I want exposure to, put exposure to that one. I don't want exposure to that one, or I want more exposure to this risk than the average investor. Lots of different reasons that you can be different from average or decide you're different from average. I I, I think an easy one is investors with long time horizons and lots of human capital. That's the ability to earn income through, through your labor. Maybe they want to take more risk in their financial asset portfolio than the average investor. Just an example. And we, we, talked to Robert Merton about this a ton as well. He had lots of interesting insights. Um, so what, 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 what would that mean in my hypothetical example there of a long time horizon and, and lots of human capital? Maybe it means tilting more towards stocks and bonds than the average investor. 
the average investors say they're fifty percent stocks, fifty percent bonds. I don't know, roughly. Um, so maybe if you if you have a longer time horizon and more human capital, maybe you want to be whatever it is, seventy or eighty percent in in stocks. Right. That's not a that's not advice. It's just a hypothetical whatever. More than average in in stocks, or maybe you want to tilt the stock portion of your portfolio toward riskier stocks. Another way to approach it. Uh, and with Robert Merton, we talked a lot about may- maybe you actually want to use leverage. That's a whole other whole other way to get more more risk exposure. Um, so that that that's the other reason you would want to be different from average. So easy starting point that's theoretically consistent and empirically makes sense is just own the market. Uh, if you think you're smarter than the market, you can try and be different, but you'll probably fail at being smarter. Uh, if you're different from the average investor, there are legitimate reasons that you would want to take different risks from the average investor, which you can still do using low-cost index funds without trying to beat the market and without getting all of the the bad characteristics like high costs and tax inefficiency that you get by typically trying to beat the market. Um, okay. And the, the, the last piece, we've talked about what a portfolio should look like, what stocks and bonds are, risk uh, differences in, in, in expected returns across financial assets. The, the, the last thing that I think people need to think about is uh, before you can invest, you have to know why you're investing. And it kind of relates to my comment a minute ago about how, how you're different from average. People can have d- different people can have different time horizons, for example, uh, based on having different objectives. You have two identical people who are otherwise identical, but they can have different goals. They want to retire at different ages. They want to, maybe one's saving up for a, for a trip or a down payment for a house and the other one's saving up for, for retirement. So you've got to understand what your objectives are and understand that different objectives will have different levels of priority in your life and they'll have different optimal portfolios to fund them. Like an easy example is an emergency fund probably shouldn't be invested in stocks. And the long-term right. retirement portfolio probably shouldn't be invested in cash. But to make that determination, is your portfolio make sense for your objectives? You have to know what your objectives are. Uh, and I, I, I think this is a real source of value for people. So we talked earlier about how hard it is for active managers to generate excess risk-adjusted returns by picking stocks and timing the market. There's a 2015 paper uh, in the Journal of Financial Planning that from David Blanchett, who's a past podcast guest. He finds using a goals-based framework to determine which goals to fund and how to fund them can lead to benefits equivalent to generating an annual alpha an annual excess risk-adjusted return that the active managers struggle to deliver on of 1.65% for the lifetime of the base scenario household in their analysis. So, I mean, that's a model, but still, the point is there's a lot of value that investors can get out of properly planning for their objectives and funding their objectives as opposed to trying to pick stocks and and time the market. It's a much more reliable way to to add value. Uh, So I, I think that's I think that's important. Financial planning as a source of alpha, I think just makes makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, so once you have your objectives, you know what you're investing for, you can start to think about your asset allocation. What should your portfolio look like? Um, and as I was just alluding to with the emergency fund example, risk takes on different forms depending on what your time horizon is. If you look at one-year periods, stocks change in value a ton. They've got high... Uh, one-year standard deviation of returns. Not great for an emergency fund. But on the other hand, over 30-year periods, cash, treasuries, they're much more likely than stocks to lose purchasing power over long periods of time. So they're very stable in the short term, which is good if you need them to fund some expense. But over the long term, you're probably going to lose money. Maybe not probably. There's a, there's a good chance you'll lose money in in cash over long periods of time. Right. Uh, okay, and then the last last piece is that once you have once you have a plan in place, you figured out what your objectives are, you figure what figured out what your asset allocation is going to be to fund those objectives. You have to be able to stick to the plan. Uh, there's always, 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 always doom and gloom about financial markets and about how bad things are going to get. I see this now a ton. This is actually in one of the common questions too. 
I see so many posts on Reddit saying, how, like, how are you preparing for the recession? The impending recession that I know is going to happen. What are you doing to prepare for it? Nobody knows if there's going to be a recession. And those conversations happen all the time. It's one of the things I learned, I don't know, maybe five or six years into doing this job. Um, I learned that there's always something that makes people think that the next few months are going to be really bad. Always, yeah. always, always, always. I can't emphasize it enough. I don't, I don't spend as much time meeting with clients at the moment, but when, when that was what I was doing all the time, and, and anytime you're talking about investing new money or, or, or whatever, or checking up on the portfolio, the conversation is always that things are about to get worse. And there's often surprises that people didn't even think of, like the pandemic, like the invasion of Ukraine. All these things happen, 9-11. But so they, they stuff happen, that but you the, worry about that you know or you think is coming, there's the stuff that's coming that you never even thought of is coming. Right. right. And the thing is, and I'll, I'll elaborate on this when we talk about the common question of what should I do to prepare for a recession, by the time you know about something, by the time you're worried about something, I'll even take a step back from that. By the time you're worried about something, it's already in market prices. Wow. Yeah. Anyway, so that doom and gloom is not going to go away though, right? And the thing about the doom and gloom is that sometimes it gets corroborated by <clears throat> actual drops in stock prices. So people always, they always have this tendency to think something bad is going to happen. And every now and then, every now and then it, it does. It, it, something bad does happen. So think about from March 2008 through February 2009, stocks dropped 50% over a year. That's the MSCI World Index in US dollars. Yeah. 50%. How would you feel if your $100,000 or a or million dollars turned into $50,000 or $500,000 over the next 12 months? That can be a real psychological constraint on asset allocation decisions. I, I really think taking too much risk can lead to like like stress, psychological stress, which can lead to physiological stress, um, and and it can lead to bad reactions. If you sell out at the bottom and don't get back in, yep. for obvious reasons, that is not very good. So, it, it, investors need to take some risk, typically, to beat inflation with their savings, and it's just smart to do that. There's an equity risk premium. We know that it's there. Uh, it, it, it makes sense to, to take advantage of it. More risk is associated with higher expected returns. Stocks are riskier than bonds because they're claims on uncertain future cash flows and they typically don't have any residual value in a corporate failure. Market prices contain a lot of information. Some investors try to outperform the market by bringing new information into prices, by, by being smart, by outsmarting the market. But that strategy, generally referred to as active management, tends to underperform the market. Instead, I think investors should just capture the returns of stocks and bonds using low-cost index funds, maybe tweak that depending on, on your own characteristics, how you're different from average. So like yeah. how much stocks versus bonds, how much riskier stocks versus safer stocks should you own? I think those things can be tailored. Um, and then the right mix of stocks and bonds and cash savings depends on your specific objectives and it's constrained by your, constrained by your psychological capacity for taking risk. So there you go. Investing basics. What do you think? Awesome. And very shareable. I agree. All right. Let's fire through these common questions. I want to ask you, you a question. You rapid, rapid fire the answer. Sure. Okay. Question number one. Should I own my employer's stock? This is, this is a great question. So it, it, empirically, it is a thing that people do, particularly when their stock has performed well in the past. I think that's super interesting on one hand. It's also super important on the other hand. Uh, there's a 2001 paper that, that looks at this and they find that employees of firms that experience the worst stock performance over the last 10 years allocate just over 10% of their discretionary contributions to company stock, whereas employees whose firms experience the best stock performance allocate almost 40% to company stock. So pe people do allocate to their company stock and they do it more so if their company stock has performed well in recent history. I think that's pretty important. Now, which we talked earlier about, uh, how, how are you different from the average investor? Well, one pretty obvious way 
is if you have an employer, your human capital is more exposed to the specific risk of your employer than the average investor. Pretty, pretty obvious and clear, I think, right? Uh, you probably don't want your human capital and your financial capital exposed to the same systematic and idiosyncratic risks. Right. It doesn't seem like the smartest thing to do. Uh, so I, I, I probably wouldn't intentionally hold a large overweight position in company stock. Now, one of the places this question often comes from is people who have equity incentives through their employer. And in some cases, you get a bonus for taking some compensation in equity. In some cases, there's a tax incentive to receive equity compensation and then hold the shares for a period of time. And this varies from country to country, but incentives like that are not uncommon, either incentives from the employer or incentives from the, from the government on the, on the tax side. So that, that, that's a, a common extension of this question, of this common question, should I own my employer's stock, but also should I hang on to my employer's stock uh, or, or take compensation in it to get some bonus, whatever the bonus might be. All, all those programs can do is, to an extent, give you a, a, bit, a bit more of a downside cushion. Like if you know your taxes will be a lot lower, for example, if you hold a, a security for an extra year, sure, there's a bit of a downside cushion. But I want to talk about some data on individual stocks for a second. There's a 2021 paper from JP Morgan. They look at the loss probabilities on individual stocks. They find that for, uh, US stocks, they find that 42% of Russell 3000 stocks have had negative absolute returns for the period 1980 through 2020. 42% negative absolute returns. 66% of individual stocks trailed the Russell 3000 index. 66% of stocks in the index trailed the index over the same time period. So there's a good chance that holding an individual stock, you're going to underperform the index. In that paper, they also look at catastrophic losses, which are defined as 70% or more declines from peak levels without a recovery to the previous peak. Across all stocks in their sample, this happens 44% of the time. 44% of the time, a stock drops 70% or more and doesn't recover. Uh, in the information technology sector, uh, from, 19, from the same period, 1980 to 2020, those losses, those catastrophic losses happen to 59% of individual stocks. And in the energy sector, 65%. I picked those two because they're the most extreme examples. Financial sector was actually, interestingly enough, the, one of the best. One of the, had the fewest catastrophic losses in the, in the US data. Anyway, so right. owning your employer stock, maybe not. If there's an incentive to do so, I would consider the risk of individual stocks in general in conjunction with taking additional risk uh, in, in your in your employer. All right. Question number two out of five. Should I hold my stock picks in my TFSA? So in Canada, that's a tax-free savings account. Yeah, equivalent to a Roth IRA-ish in the, in the U.S. Roughly similar. I'm not an expert on that type of account. So, so get, get, should, should you hold your stock picks in, in the TFSA, in, in, in your tax-free account, uh, in your post-tax savings account? Given the data that we just reviewed, you're more likely to lose than win picking individual stocks. Uh, if you win in, in, in your tax-free account, it is great because you don't pay tax on the capital gain. If you lose, it's not so great because you evaporate your contribution room and you don't get to claim a capital loss. In, in Canada, if you lose on an investment in a taxable investment account, you can claim that loss uh, against any capital gain income in the current year or the previous three years. Uh, years. Right. So I think you you magnify both your after-tax upside and your after-tax downside by investing in individual stocks in a tax-free account. But when you consider the long-term benefits of holding a positive expected return portfolio inside of a TFSA, I, I think when you project that out, the costs of the downside of, of evaporating your, your TFSA room are substantial. So I, in my view, unless you're for some reason certain that you're going you're gonna to win the lottery, uh, I, I think the downside of losing your TFSA room and foregoing the capital loss, which is more likely to happen than a gain, significantly outweighs the potential of, of the less likely good outcome where you get 
tax-free gains. The, the other thing there is that capital gains are the most tax-efficient, typically the most tax-efficient form of income, or one of the most tax-efficient forms of income in Canada. So it's like, I don't know. Okay. Number three, and I think we know the answer, but ask it anyways. How should I prepare my portfolio for a recession? P portfolio management can't be reactionary. It's what I said earlier. By the time you have the information to make a change to your portfolio, that information is probably already in market prices. Even if you take predictors that are supposed to be reliable but aren't always like the yield curve, where when the yield curve inverts, it's you're supposed to be followed by a recession sometimes. From a portfolio management perspective, still not useful. Fahm and French had a paper looking at that where they find no evidence that yield curve inversions can help investors avoid poor stock returns. I think, now that does, doesn't mean there's nothing you should do. If you're worried about a recession, maybe that's more of a reflection on your risk tolerance than it is on your ability to predict the future. But if you're worried about a recession, having sufficient pre precautionary savings, having an emergency fund to absorb economic shocks, I don't think that's a bad idea under any circumstances. And again, that should be based on your risk tolerance more so than your predictions about the future. If you are worried about stuff like that, you should have an emergency fund all the time, not when you think there's going to be a recession. Um, and, and then there's others like ensure that you have marketable skills. If you're worried about losing your job, make, make put, put yourself in a situation where you're more likely to be able to get a, a, another job. Um, I think managing your expenses, and I know that's hard right now with inflation, but ma managing your expenses, increasing your savings, those, these are all ways to increase your financial resilience, which is a good thing all the time, not just when you think a recession is coming. Number four, how does real estate compare to the stock market and how does direct ownership compare to REITs or real estate investment trusts? Real estate, it's got returns that look like, if you look through the lens of, of asset pricing, the returns of real estate look like a portfolio of risky stocks and, and bonds. The evidence that, that's taken that lens, looked at real estate uh, through, through that lens, suggests that real estate doesn't offer exposure to distinct economic risks. It gives you exposure to economic risks that you could alternatively get through stocks and bonds, but in the case of REITs, at least if you're overweighting them relative to market cap weights, you're, you're also taking the specific risk, the, the idiosyncratic risk, the diversifiable risk of the real estate sector. The evidence also suggests that direct real estate investments don't offer anything special over public REITs once you adjust for stuff like sector exposure and the valuation lag in private markets. Some people may still want to invest in private real estate because maybe they want the sector exposure that you get from private real estate, but there, there's nothing special there. And you pay a whack of costs for investing in, in private uh, REITs. Direct ownership may have the advantage of, of access to cheap leverage. Um, I don't love the idea of levering up a concentrated investment, very concentrated. Like it's a single, if you're, if you're buying a single house as an investment property, taking out a bunch of debt to do so, ah, I'd be nervous personally. People do well that way. But I think you're taking a ton of risk. And we haven't had a proper real estate downturn in Canada for more than 30 years. So who knows if some people will get caught with their pants off when the tide goes out on that one. If it goes out, that's not a prediction. Uh, an owned home is a little different from an investment in an investment property because owning a home that you want to live in provides a perfect hedge or close to a perfect hedge for the cost of consuming that specific home. So that's a whole other thing, rent versus buy. But anyway, there, there's a case where, where real estate, own, an owned home, real estate asset, acts as a hedge as opposed to a risky investment. And provides entertainment with squirrels. Okay, question number five, and then you get a bit of a break. So do I need an emergency fund? Yeah, so this is, this is something that I picked up reading Anna Maria Lusardi's research. The, the way that they look at this at, at precautionary savings it is through the lens of would you be able to come up with cash in an emergency? So they don't necessarily ask, do you have a dedicated emergency fund, you know, a, a bank account labeled emergency fund that you keep cash in? That's not the question they ask. They ask the question of, could you come up with cash in an emergency? Households that can't come up with cash in an emergency are considered financially fragile. Now, financial fragility has a lot of other baggage that comes with it. So based on Canadian data, uh, I, I find this data fascinating. 
Financially fragile households have lower financial, emotional, and physical well-being. They've got less satisfaction at work, and they report less social connection. Mm. You don't want to be financially fragile. So on the question of do you need an emergency Mm. fund, I would step back from that and say that the objective should be avoiding financial fragility. Having an emergency fund is a pretty good way, but not necessarily the only way to accomplish that. The, the, the nice thing about cash is that it holds its nominal value. It's nominal value, not, not its real value. Uh, but if you have $1,000 in your bank account, it'll still be $1,000 in your bank account tomorrow. The other thing that is nice about cash is that you, uh, with, with a line of credit as another alternative, many of those are callable. So it's possible that you go to draw from your line of credit and your bank says, no, you can't take that much. Correct. Or no, we're going to amortize the loan starting starting tomorrow. So that's the nice thing about cash. And the, the other thing it's, you know, I've lived this actually, is, is and I'm not saying everybody should go in and do this, but it's it's worth mentioning because I, I have experienced it. Having cash, cash, like currency uh, for proper emergencies can be not the worst idea too. We, we had that where we had the derecho thing where like all of Ottawa and surrounding areas lost power for multiple days mm-hmm. and you needed cash to buy gas and stuff like that because nobody had payment processing. It's a good point. You know, I've been to the bank machine once since the pandemic started. So it'd be almost three years I've been to a bank machine. I've not been to a bank. I've been I, five virtually times. cashless since then. M- me too, except for the week that we had no power and yeah. we had one power outage since then where like to go and buy gas for our, our generator, yes. I had to go and get cash in yes. the bank. Oh, I, I agree with you. I'm just saying I've been lucky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I noticed too, I noticed Morgan Housel tweeted last week and I've observed this as well. Have you noticed the usage of Apple Pay seems to have skyrocketed in the past, I don't know, few months i have not noticed know, personally it's, it's incredible i've just noticed that so many people anyways you get to take a bit of a break now so i get to uh carry a bit of water here for a bit that was awesome all right so we're ready to move on to uh one episode in 60 seconds yep see what we can do it i got my stopwatch here so here we go uh we were lucky to welcome cliff asnes back on episode 93 cliff has had an incredible career from being a ta for yes professor fama but also co-founding aqr Cliff is an absolutely brilliant communicator, uh, incredible mix of intellect, humor, and conviction. I think make that episode an absolute must listen. Ideas such as market efficiency, his nuanced differences with Professor Fama, why value makes sense, and why he's not a big believer in the size factor. And we also discuss uh, whether the 6040 is dead and his pushback to us was define what is in the 6040. So ask what could be done to improve the 6040. He said, add in small value momentum international, and you get a very different portfolio with improved expected returns. And the part that I loved in our conversation, Ben, with him was, he said, when something is dead, this means that something else was not, referring to the US market for the past decade or so. And he said, never forget, if something is kicking the hell out of everyone for a long time, it also makes it expensive. So we're all investing for long-term security and prosperity. And there's been an incredible learning from academia for the past 50 years. And you need to understand and believe in what has been learned and work with people who can communicate these ideas so that you stay in your seat when the inevitable volatility shows up. And I believe this conversation will certainly help with that. Blew over by 20 seconds. Ah, oh, sorry. It's all right. It was a good, good episode was, review. That was a great episode. I loved it. Okay, so I want to do a quick book review for everyone. Uh, on the Culture Playbook, 60 Highly Effective Actions to Help Your Group Succeed by Daniel Coyle. So released earlier this year, and it's a follow-up to his original New York Times bestseller, The Culture Code, which came out in 2018, and we reviewed on episode 187. He is a very frequent podcast guest. I love how he thinks about culture and communicates uh, on culture. This book, which is why I had to bring it up, his book up again, is basically a curation of all these things he's been collecting for years about culture. And it he puts that this is kind of the culminating tool of his work on culture. So to put it simply, he says that culture is your actions at work. So this book collects 60 what he thinks are key actions that can improve your culture. 
I'm not going to go through all 60, but I thought I'd just cover off some of the keys that I took away from. It's also a very readable book. Like they're easy lists. It's a super fast. It's a good reference book. I have it on my Kindle. I think it makes sense to get a hard copy just to have, you know, by your desk, whether you work from home or at the office. Anyways, culture is a skill you learn. Culture is always changing and evolving. Your job is to continually adapt, respond, and keep culture strong and healthy. Um, off the top, he also argues, and most importantly, you always start with making sure you have a clear purpose for the organization. Then you must create an environment that creates belonging and rallies that whole group as one entity around that purpose. There is a science to this. And it's built through, I thought this was really interesting, built through the exchange of belonging cues. So these are small, what do you call small vivid behaviors that send a crystal clear message that we are connected, we share a future, I care about you, you have a voice here and you matter. He also talked about the importance of keeping eyebrows raised, eyes alert and open, and like how we uh, signal this attention, this energy and enthusiasm and engagement matters a ton. And it's even more important, and this is the part that really got me, it's even more important in a virtual world because there's so much fewer um, physical cues going on that don't show up because you're not face-to-face -face in real life. So be so very should, aware should, of that. I should keep doing my, my rapid head nodding when you I gotta do keep things? The, you got to keep, apparently it's like the, I forget the word that, that he used, but it's important to keep your eyes moving, your eyebrows moving, keep the visual connection. He says, your face is like a door. It can be closed or open. You want to make sure you keep the door open. Uh, he also refers to Amy Edmondson of Harvard. So we did a book review of the Fearless Organization back in episode 211. And to quote the author, when people believe they can speak up at work, their performance of their organization is greater. He also talked about thank yous. Thank yous aren't only expressions of gratitude, but they spark a contagious sense of safety, connection, and motivation. Use in-person interactions like a booster shot, especially when it comes to creativity. So we talked about this episode 215, um, the book Running Remote. It does not take much physical togetherness to build a strong team. And that's something that I completely agree with, and I know you do also. Always aim to keep project teams to around six people. A six-person team contains 15 two-person relationships, which is a very manageable number of interactions. Stop saying culture fit and start saying culture contribution. Emphasize how you fit to make the sum bigger than its parts. One way to, to do this is to start asking yourself and your team these questions. What new perspectives do we need to seek? Who can challenge us to get most out of our comfort zone? Here's another good one I thought was interesting. Embrace flash mentoring instead of traditional mentoring. And this is where a younger team member approaches a, a veteran team member with a low stakes, can we grab coffee kind of request. But the mentee's objective should not be to necessarily gain factual knowledge, but rather, a coil suggests, to absorb how the mentor thinks, how they spot and conceptualize problems and opportunities. Gossip, get this, gossip is a cultural glue. I was surprised by this. So he says, of, of course, you have to avoid the mean-spirited type of gossip. However, work to continue the, con the, the organic flow of informal chatter matters a lot. High-performing teams set aside time just for hanging out, period, just to get into sync with each other. Perhaps the most common misconception about successful teams is that they are tension-free places where disagreements are rare and mistakes are few. That is not even remotely true. Successful cultures don't transcend tensions. They embrace them and use them as cultural fuel. They lean into uncomfortable conversations, navigate disagreements, and embrace their mistakes. Happy smoothness isn't a feature. It is a bug to overcome. So call out smoothness, he says, as a negative. If you hold a meeting with zero questions or disagreements, you should point that out as unproductive. If everybody agrees, why did you bother to get together? If all the feedback is positive, why did you even ask for feedback? Conflict and tension are not problems to be avoided. They are opportunities for your group to figure things out better together. Highlights to distinguish between relational conflict and task conflict. 
Relational conflict is between people, me versus you, personality oriented, and it's almost always unproductive. However, task conflict, my idea versus your idea, Ben, is an engine for innovation and should be cultivated. When you encounter tension, always make it about the ideas and not about the people. Make it safe to talk about mistakes. Do post-mortems after any project. What went well? What didn't go well? What are we going to do differently next time? Probably the most effective trust building question, he says, is if you could wave a magic wand and change one thing about the way we work, what would it be? This one I think is potentially controversial. He says, avoid brutal honesty. Embrace warm candor. He says, look, I'm going to be brutally honest with you. Might feel authentic, but it creates a culture of brutality, which he said is not not healthy. Uh, You know the phrase, don't shoot the messenger, says Professor Amy Edmondson. You have to hug the messenger, Coyle says, and let them know how much you need that feedback. That way you can be sure that they feel safe enough to tell you the plain truth. Here's one I like a lot. Play the subtraction game. Many cultures face the disease of more. Always review what you do and eliminate what might have once been useful, but now is just kind of an old habit you're just doing for the sake of doing it. So that's my bullet review of the book. Highly recommend it. It's a very handy tool and very easy read. All right. Let's go to our conversation now with uh, Professor Amr Kaisi, and we'll come up on the other side with our after show. Professor Amr Casey, welcome to the Russia Miners 22 and 22 Reading Challenge. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, it's great to finally meet you. We've mentioned you often on this on this podcast, and I want to congratulate you on your terrific book, Humbitious. And I thought before we dive into your reading habits, I, I have to ask you, since you're here, can you just give us a quick summary of your book, Humbitious? Absolutely. And, and thank you for having me, Cameron. And, and it's a great pleasure to be with you all. Yeah, the main idea in ambitious is that in leadership, humility is not a weakness. It's actually a strength and it can be a superpower when combined with ambition. Now, many people, when they think of a humble leader, they might think of someone who is weak or passive, but that is a wrong belief. You know, humility requires a lot of strength and a lot of courage. And that's really what the main idea of this book is. Hmm. Do do you think that someone can learn to be humble and ambitious? Yeah, you know, that that is a big part of this book is, is what are some of the takeaways, what are some of the specific behaviors that leaders can work on if they believe that they are low on the humility part? Now, other leaders may be high on the humility part, but need to work on their ambition. And, and that is also possible. Um, you know, specific behaviors to work on humility include things such as, you know, listening to understand versus listening to reply, um, asking for feedback, developing open-mindedness, showing appreciation towards others. So there's a list of behaviors that, that you know, we share in the book that can help people work on their humility. And in and, and my work as an executive coach, I've seen a lot of leaders start from a point where, where their humility was a little bit low, and then they were able to to dial it up over time with intentionality and and with, um, you know, hard work. Can you also learn to be ambitious or is ambitious uh, like a trait you're born with? I believe that ambitious is another one that we can work on and, and dial up if we are intentional about it and if we get some appropriate guidance you know, we can learn to speak up in meetings. We can learn to become a little bit more assertive in terms of sticking our necks out uh, in in the organization, you know, raising your hand in a meeting. We can learn to have difficult conversations with others, develop that skills that go into, you know, how to um, go in and and have, you know, a crucial conversation with your boss or with your direct report. What what are the skills needed? What what kind of courage and confidence you need to develop over time? So I, I believe all of these fall under ambition and they definitely can be um, developed with intentionality. So the part of your book that really resonated with me about the whole ambitious idea is, is the basic belief that anyone has a capacity for substantial growth and self-development. How important in your mind is reading as part of that self-development? Oh, I think it's a a significant part of it. You know, as as you recall, there are two chapters in the book that deal with self-awareness and self-reflection. And I believe that reading books is a significant part of 
our self-awareness. And I believe it was um, Tolstoy who, who said a long time ago that, that when we read, you know, we give ourselves the opportunity to communicate with the wisest people who ever lived on earth. And my question is always, why would anyone choose not to do that, right? <laughs> why would you deprive yourself of the chance to be in dialogue and communicate with, with some of the best minds that have lived on, on this earth? So I, I think it's a big part of it. Can you tell us about your reading habits? You know, my reading habits is that I read everywhere and all the time. <laughs> I always have at least one book with me wherever I go. Um, for example, you know, I have a 15-year-old son who plays competitive soccer. And whenever I drop him at his soccer practice, the first thing I do is I grab my lawn chair, I sit on the sidelines, and I read. And, you know, all the other parents are on their phones or maybe they're chit-chatting. And, I mean, they see me reading. First time they saw me reading, they're like, they looked at me weird, like, wow, you have a book with you. <laughs> so I, I do that everywhere. I mean, I read at the airport. I read on long plane rides. The other day, I was just flying back from, from Portland to, to San Antonio, where I live, and I made it a point to look around me on the plane. There is not a single person who had a physical book with them. Maybe some of them were reading a book on their phones, but I highly doubt it. But, but almost everyone was on a phone or a tablet or watching a movie. You don't see people these days reading a physical book. And, and I, I like I like reading. I like having a book with me all the time. You know, if, if I'm at the doctor's office and, you know, they, they make you wait 30 minutes or 45 minutes, most of us would go on our phones and waste our time. I always have a book with me and I try to take advantage of that time. For the benefit of those listening and not watching on YouTube, your backdrop has probably hundreds of hard copy books. Do you always read hard copy? I prefer hard copy, but I also listen to a lot of audiobooks. I mean, you know, it's it's such a convenient way of reading a lot of books. So I also listen to audiobooks when I'm cooking, when I'm doing the dishes, when I'm running outside, when I'm driving to work. I have a 25-minute commute, so I listen. On long trips, I, I love audiobooks. So I, I don't discriminate against <laughs> audiobooks. I, I love them as, as much as I love um, uh, physical copies. How do you decide what to read or listen to? You know, podcasts are a great source. Podcasts like this one, you know, um, many podcasts interview authors like myself who have just published a new book. So if I'm listening to that podcast and I like what, what the guest is saying, I, I just go online right away and I order their book. Um, you know, there, there's so many of them, but there's one specific podcast that is related to books. And it's a podcast called Three Books. Um, by Neil Pasricha, where, where he brings in people, he interviews them, and he asks them about, you know, to share their three most formative books. That podcast, I got a lot of ideas from it. I also intentionally search for books, you know, depending on the project that, that I'm working on. You know, I, I do my own research on books and, and related books. And I also have one habit that, that um, I try to implement a lot of time, which is when I meet someone that I think is someone who's very interesting, you know, towards the end of the conversation, I always ask, what is a great book that you have read in the last year? And, and I bet you this is better than any online algorithm in terms of people will share with you some, some of the best books um, that way. Fascinating. Neil was a past guest of ours as well. Um, this next question is a question I've been most looking forward to asking you, which is your book, Ambitious, is a perfect example of a book that has lots of takeaways. So many listeners right now work in organizations, they lead organizations, and they probably read a fair amount on the subject of leadership and culture and organizations. Do you have advice for them, for us, on how to decide what to apply from your book and how to apply it to the organization? Yeah, you know, Cameron, that, that's a great question. And, and we have to be careful. And, and we have to understand that there is nothing that applies to all situations all the time, right? If I were to sit here and say, be hum humble or be ambitious all the time in every situation, that would be bad advice. So, you know, my book's advice is, is to be a more humble leader in general. But what if your boss and the whole organization doesn't believe in humility? then it's bad advice. It's not, it's not good advice. What if you are in a situation that requires you to make a quick decision like a crisis or an emergency? 
being humble in that situation and listening and reaching consensus and collaborating is also probably going to be bad advice. In that situation, you have to be more decisive. You just need to make a decision and tell people what to do. So, you know, you have to take the takeaways, but you also have to make sense of them and customize them to your own situation, to your organization, and, and to the culture in which you work in. Hmm. Yeah, that that is good advice. How, how do you capture and, and, and organize the, the things that you learn from reading? So, so when I'm reading a physical book, I always have a highlighter with me. You know, um, a few years ago, I went on online and I ordered a big box of highlighters and I have them everywhere, you know, in the car, in my bag, in the house, I have highlighters everywhere. So when I'm reading something and, and I like it, I like the paragraph or the idea, I highlight that. And then when I finish the book, I transcribe all of these into a Word document. And sometimes I do it myself, but but when my kids have time, I actually hire them to do that for me, which oh, I wow. think is is a good I mean, I have a 15 year old and, and an 18 year old and you know during breaks or when when they don't have a lot of work or or commitments they they are willing to do that for me and, and I pay them for that but I I think it's also a good thing for them to be exposed to some of the books that I'm reading but anyways you know so so what I have is I have a word document that per, uh, you know relates to every book that I've read and then I have summaries of all of these books I've, I've had these for the last 10 years and then at the end of each year, I go back and I read all of the summaries as a way to internalize all the learning and kind of make connections between the various concepts between the books. I do the same if I'm listening to an audiobook. If I'm listening to a book and I hear an interesting idea that catches my attention, I pause the recording and then I write the idea on the notes app on the phone. And this way I, I, I capture all of these ideas and then I add them um, after that to, to the list of um, Word documents on, on every book. Hmm. That must be one incredible Word document you have now. Yeah, it's, it's it, I mean, it's, you know, Cameron, like if, if, if we don't capture those ideas, then like, what is the point of reading? I, I don't know. I'm someone that doesn't remember stuff. Sometimes I, I will read a book and then six months later, I'm like, what did I learn from this book if I didn't capture those those thoughts, right? So um, for me, it's, it's, it's just, it only makes sense to be capturing your thoughts or capturing the, the ideas from the book in, in that way. And then after that, you can, you know, use them for different projects you're working on or just, just for your own self-development. So your book is about leadership. Before you wrote this book, did you have some favorite leadership books? Oh, there are there are so many, and and some of them may not be considered leadership books per se, but but for me they kind of influenced um, my thinking about leadership. One of them is a very famous book by Carol Dweck called Mindset. Um, I'm sure you know yep. you, you you all are familiar with the the you know our listeners are familiar with it, and and there's a lot of overlap between the concepts of this book and and the ones that I talk about in in Humbitious. Um, There is Quiet by Susan Cain. You know the power of introverts yep. in a world that doesn't um, you know stop talking. So these are not leadership books per se, but I believe they pertain to leadership. And then if we get more specifically to about leadership books, um, you know some of my favorites are. The Five Dysfunctions of the Team by Patrick Lencioni, mm -hmm. um, The Speed of Trust by Stephen M. R. Covey, and, and then there's just so many others, obviously. Are, are there any books that you regularly go back and, and reread? You know, there, there's one book specifically that I go back and reread, and, and this one is a, a little bit morbid, but, but I'll, I'll explain. So, so the book is called The Five Regrets of the Dying by Bronnie Ware. All right. So and, and Bronnie Ware was a palliative care nurse in Australia. So pretty much what she did was she took care of people who were dying. But when she spent time with them in their last few days, they she asked them, what are your five regrets? Right. You know, what are your regrets in your life in general? And then based on that, she she summarized those regrets into five main regrets that people shared with her. And, and the reason I like to go back and read that book every now and then is because it reminds me of the things that I'm not focusing on in my life that I should be focusing on because these are probably going to be the things that I'm going to regret, you know, hopefully after a long life after, on, on my deathbed. And, and there are things that, you know, she talks in this book about people sharing with her that they wish that 
you know, they had the courage to live a true life to themselves rather than what others expected from them. Another main regret was, I wish I hadn't worked so hard, right? And, and, and you know, us as, as professionals, as overachievers, sometimes we forget that. We, we, you know, we focus too much on work, which we should be doing, but sometimes we forget the other important stuff. So, so that book is always, for me, a reminder of what my priorities should be in life in addition to work, in addition to professional achievements. As you know, Emmer, I've recommended your book, Ambitious, to many people. Do you have books that you recommend to others? And if so, what might they be? Yeah, you know, I, I recommend a lot of different books depending on what that person is working on. Again, as, as an executive coach, you know, I work with leaders. I work with my own students at the university. And, and every person is working on something different. So depending on their area for development, I, I recommend one of many books. For example, there, there's a great book called Leading with Emotions. And, and this one I recommend for leaders who kind of tend to show up a little bit more cold, more robotic, and, and not bringing emotion to the workplace. Um, there's another book that, that is more of a workbook. It's called The Assertiveness Workbook. And it's a, it's a little known book, but that one I recommend for individuals who are working on dialing up their ambition, as we talked earlier, and, and being more assertive. Um, there's a great book called How to Raise Your Self-Esteem. That, that's one that I typically recommend for individuals who come to leadership with a little bit of a lower self-regard or, or confidence in themselves. For those who are on the other end of the spectrum, I recommend Ego is the Enemy by, um, uh, by Ryan Holiday. Um, for people who are working on networking skills, one I recommend a lot is Never Eat Alone by, by Keith Ferrazzi. So, so it's, it's not just one book for everyone, but rather depending on what that individual is working on, I, I, I probably recommend something specific. You mentioned earlier your your habit of reading all the time. What, what advice do you have for other people who maybe want to read more in, I guess, in 2023 at this point? Yeah, you know, you, you I'm sure you've talked to a lot of people who say, I want to read more. And then you ask, well, what are you doing to read more? And, and you know, they say, well, I'm not doing much. And so, so my advice is like, I mean, it's pretty simple. Like you got to invest time and you also got to invest money. Now, Maybe, you know, the money part you can, you can, you know, bypass by borrowing book from the library, from the public library at first. But, but the time one is, is non-negotiable. You got to invest time in this thing. And, you know, one, one of the things that, that bothered me a little bit is now all of this advice about, you know, how to listen to a book at three times the speed or how can you speed read through mm -hmm. a book? You know, you just read the first page and you skip the chapter and you just so you can finish so many books. And, and my reaction to that is that that's not the way I like to read at all. I, I want to I wanna take my time with the book. I want to enjoy it. I want to digest the book. So I don't like to finish books so fast because then you're not taking the full advantage of the book. So, so investing the time is, is a key for me. You, you got to put in time in there and, and make sure that, that you're, you're um, you know, spending time on 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 books and and learning from them and all of the other things we talked about my other advice would be you know if you're 50 pages into a book and and you're not learning from it and you're not enjoying it then what's the point right just ditch it and get another book so so you know one one thing i learned from from that podcast we mentioned earlier from from neil pasricha is quitting is okay and and like that was that was the great um, insight in terms of giving me the permission to quit a book because prior to that like if I started a book I felt like I had an obligation to finish it even if I wasn't learning from it or I'm not enjoying it and now you know if if I'm into it and and I'm not getting anything out of it then I'm done I'm, I'm gonna move on to read something else because you know our time is so precious life is too short to spend your time on on books that honestly probably are not that good for you yeah, and if you just make it a regular habit, it's incredible how the books just get completed. Half an hour, hour a day. Yeah. Just do a little bit every day. That's been my experience anyways. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the key is consistency. This has been amazing. Thanks so much for joining us, Amr. It's been great to have you on. Oh, absolutely. It's my pleasure. Thank you both. Thank you. All right. That was an awesome conversation with uh, Amr. 
so great to have him on. It's Definitely. the after show for the three people that are left. Since you did this presentation, do you want to take a crack at the first review that someone was kind enough to leave us? Uh, sure, sure, I can take a crack at that. Uh, so it's from uh, P- PF- PFI Conference on Apple Podcasts. Uh, they say that it's the number one podcast in the physician community. And they said, thank you, Ben, for taking the time to answer our questions and speak at the Physicians Financial Wellness Conference. I really appreciate the research and expertise that goes into each episode, as well as the breadth of topics covered from wealth, health, and happiness. As a doctor, I am learning lots from your guests, not just on finances, but burnout, motivation, and decision-making. You're doing great work in giving your time and knowledge in guiding physicians and educating students on investing. I hope you have the time to take care of yourself and enjoy your new trampoline, which is pretty (laughs) smart to put it indoors so you can use it year round. (laughs) So I, for maybe context on that quickly, there was a, this, as they mentioned, the, the physician's financial wellness conference, uh, that I spoke at, there were, I think a couple hundred doctors that it's a very cool thing that they do. Um, but it's like, you know, there's a stereotype of, doctors and it's a stereotype i hope no one takes offense to this is a stereotype of doctors being bad with money because they're often confident they're often intelligent uh and then that that makes it easy for them to make money mistakes you're you're cringing Sean, not a no not at all i i, I just <laughs> say i i know some doctors that are exceptionally good at their money yeah so it is, I, but it's it is a, a stereotype it's a, it, absolutely it's a, stereotype. it's a stereotype for sure it's a stereotype and so they've they've th- this community of physicians have, have taken that very seriously and they've created this Love community it. that they, they have a big uh, Facebook group I believe that only physicians can be in where they all share good personal finance knowledge stuff and then they have this conference that they put on uh, to help people think about tax and investing and, and all, all of the beautiful stuff that's relevant to, to, to physicians so it's a, it's a very impressive cool thing and I'm I'm glad to have been up this is the second time I've yeah. spoken at it no kidding uh, a few LinkedIn reach outs I got in the past couple of weeks. Jonathan, an advisor from Edinburgh, has been enjoying the podcast. George from London. Wow, so glad that you re-recommended the Colonel Hadfield episode. So many great insights, like it seems others did. I skipped past that one as it wasn't typical finance content. Genuinely one of the best RR episodes. Also from Alexis, an engineer in London, reached out saying, my family has a terrible history of investing and has a perpetual fear of equities, yet gives me advice such as getting multiple mortgages as it's guaranteed money. I've been self-educating myself for a while and your podcast plays a large role in that. I enjoy your factual-based summarization of papers, as I don't yet read them myself, as well as discussions with professionals. I do find some topics a little too advanced. However, I believe that listening to experts discuss topics as they would over coffee helps me absorb the knowledge in an efficient and unique manner. The alternative being lectures designed for my level, which simplify topics a great deal. It's how I learned computer science. My goals are financial independence without the retirement bit through cap weighted world equity portfolio by investing a minimum of 25K USD annually. Very clear goal. Love it. Okay, you, you can talk about the Spotify rap, which man, this past week, it's been everywhere. Oh, really? I have, I have, I have not noticed that. Uh, yeah, so this is our Spotify wrap summary, which is like on the creator side, I guess. It's different from what our listeners would get. Maybe that's maybe that's obvious. Uh, so we created in 2022, and I guess this is up to that point because we, we're, we're creating yes. more content in this calendar year. Uh, <clears throat> yes. We, we created f- 4,160 minutes of new content. It's pretty crazy. Uh, Rash Reminder was listened to in 90 countries. Also pretty crazy. Top countries, this is on Spotify. It's the yes. same. I'm pretty sure it's the same on Apple Podcasts approximately. Um, anyway, top countries on Spotify, Canada, US, Australia, Germany, and the UK. And again, I'm pretty sure that generalizes to Apple Podcasts too. It's at least very similar where it's Canada first, US. Uh, on Spotify, th- this surprised me, honestly. Uh, top 1% most shared podcasts globally crazy i i no. wouldn't have guessed that no uh, chance also top one percent most followed podcasts never guess guessed that either now this one this one blew my mind i wouldn't have guessed those ones i, I wouldn't have guessed this one either because again i get stuck in this you know there, there's people in the rational reminder community that I, I talk about random investing stuff with all the time or I, I read their posts or whatever 
And it's a relatively small number of people, and it's a consistent group of people that are very active in there. So I have this imagi- uh, imaginary <clears throat> image of this like static podcast audience. 65% of our podcast listeners discovered the podcast in 2022. That blew my mind. Yeah. Totally blew my mind. In other news, uh, I have to cancel the meetup in Orlando. It's just not going to work out. And we got feedback in the community to have a meetup in New York City, which would be super cool, which I'm sure will happen at some point. But I think in the very near future, hopefully in like Q1 next year, we want to have a meetup in Ottawa and Montreal. So if you're interested, we're going to build a list. Email info at rationalminder.ca and we'll let you know if there's enough interest to do that, which I suspect it will be. Two meetups? Ottawa and Montreal? Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Social butterfly over here. Um, Lots of merch in the store and still time to order before Christmas. We'll make sure Jackie will for sure get them out to you in time. So one of the most popular items in the store has been the Talking Sense cards. And when I was at the uh, London meetup three weeks ago, uh, one of the guests there was Chris, who's a math teacher in London. And he was talking about cards and I happened to have a set, an extra set with me. So I gave him a set to, to use in his class. So he dropped me a note of thanks, dropped us a note of thanks last week and said he's been using them in class with great success. So I thought we'd put it out there if there's teachers that are listening that would benefit from using Talking Sense in class and maybe you don't have a budget for cards in your school, drop us a note. I think we can easily contribute some decks of cards to teachers. We'll see what the demand is like, but I, I think it's something that we should do. Especially when you read the, the note that, that Chris sent. So thanks, Chris, for the inspiration. As always, uh, connect with us on LinkedIn. We're both on Twitter, Rational Minder on Instagram, CP313, and hashtag Rational Minder on Peloton. Speaking of Florida, it is wild. I never even thought of looking at getting tickets to, to take the kids when we're there to Disney. It's basically sold out over Christmas. Never, never even thought about it, but there's only a few days where a couple of the parks are available. And let me tell you, it is not the cheapest day you'll ever spend in your life. I don't, I don't get it. What, it's why do wild. You, can, you, can you articulate to me why you want to go to Disney? Oh, it's amazing. It is, it is truly an experience. I, I get it. I, I totally get it. I've been I'm just there. saying, no, linking back to conversation about recessions and stuff, it's like, <laughs> and I've done a fair amount of travel this quarter. It is not visibly obvious that there's a recession happening. Yeah. And I don't mean yeah. that in an insensitive way. I'm sure people are struggling. I get it. But boy, the airports are jammed. Restaurants are jammed. Restaurants in London, jammed. It's wild. Airports, like of all the flights I took this quarter, I don't, I think there was one flight I saw, I actually got lucky with an empty seat beside me in one of the flights. But everything's jammed. Hmm. You try to get into the Air Canada Lounge. Air Canada gives out these free lounge passes. Well, the, the lounge is packed. You can't get in the lounge. It's wild. Try getting your rental car in Florida. I won't. I, 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 I can't imagine doing any of those things. Yeah, no, Disney's my kids, not, my kids Disney's are probably never going to Disney. Disney's not your, your, it's not your milieu, but it, it, it's an incredible experience. Been it. I, yeah. I did it. My parents took me and, and my sister when we were kids because they wanted to take their kids to Disney because that's what people do. Yeah. Hated it. Yeah. <laughs> Never going back. Yeah. It's amazing. Not, not to diminish the, the great time that I'm sure you will have. Oh, we'll have a great time. I, your, your impact, your feedback's not affecting me. We're all different. <laughs> I know it's not your happy place. Uh, yeah. All right. Anything else, Ben? No, no, no. I think that's uh, I think that's good. Beautiful. Thanks everybody for listening. Yeah.